put those away. But I'm really glad you're here tonight. Um, so travel back with me for a second to your first week of school, your freshman year. Like, you know no one, right? Everyone is asking just like the same three questions over and over again. Like, what's your major? Where are you from? Why'd you choose this school? So if you were to meet me my first week of my freshman year of college, and you would have asked me why I chose to go to Mizzou, I would have given you like the entire sales pitch for tour team. For some reason, I toured Mizzou three times because I guess one time wasn't enough. And like everything that tour team was selling, I was buying. Like I was so pumped to be in college and I was so excited to choose Mizzou. I was super excited for things like Mizzou traditions and things like Mizzou football season, which is funny if you know me because I don't know anything about sports still. And I was really, really excited to get to join a sorority. I had really looked forward to getting to join Greek Life. I was the first uh, in my family to go to a four-year university. And to me, like, I had this like huge built-up picture of what sorority life would look like for me whenever I got to college, and I could not wait. And so my first week of freshman year, I'm going through sorority recruitment, and I'm loving it. Like, I cannot wait for bid day. I had, again, built up this, like, huge experience in my head of opening my envelope and getting to run home to my house and getting to meet all my new sisters and just getting to experience this, like, whole sisterhood thing. And so flash forward to morning of bid day, I had, like, barely slept the night before, and I get a phone call from my Pai Kai at 6 a.m. And those of you who don't know, Pai Kais are the women that kind of run sorority recruitment. And those of you who do know, you know that you never want a phone call from your Pai Kai at 6 a.m., like any of the days during recruitment, but especially not bid day. And so I look at my phone, I see that it's my Pai Kai, my heart like drops into my stomach and I answer it. And my Pai Kai tells me that I had been dropped from recruitment that I was not going to participate in bid day and I had not received any bids from any of the sororities. And so, I mean, classes hadn't started yet, right? Like my freshman year was off to a great start. Um, I was down real bad. Like I had built up, right, this huge picture of what I wanted my college experience to look like and who I wanted to be in college. And I felt like everything had just been ripped out from under me and classes hadn't even started yet. I mean, I was in a legitimate like identity crisis. I was depressed and anxious and lonely. And at the time, I was already a Christian, so I had become a Christian my junior year of high school. And so I knew while I was going through this that, you know, this rejection didn't define me. And I knew that I was enough, not because of whether or not I got into a sorority, but enough because of what Jesus had done for me. Like, I knew this. I knew that this was true. But at the same time, like, I was feeling, I mean, depressed and anxious and lonely. I mean, I was feeling like I didn't know who I was anymore. There was this disconnect between what I knew and what, what I knew to be true and what I felt and, and how I was experiencing the things in my life. Now, I don't know about you, but I would guess that you feel that too, to some extent. Like, you know that you shouldn't base your identity on what other people think of you. But at the same time, if you're being honest, you care a lot whether or not you get invited to that thing on Friday night. Or, like, you know that you shouldn't find your identity in your grades or your performance. But at the same time, like, you get really, really stressed when it comes to exam season. Or maybe you know that you shouldn't base your identity on your image, the image of yourself that you project into the world. But at the same time, like, you have a lot of walls up and around parts that you don't want other people to see and be let into. I mean, I could keep going. Like, we've been talking this whole semester about all of these things that we can put our identity in, things like other people, things like being enough, our performance, our image, our labels. And in all of these things, we've been reminding ourselves constantly that we are forgiven, that we serve an audience of one, that we're enough not because of anything that we do or could do, but because of what Jesus has done, that our image, we are more than the sum of our labels, and we belong here not because our image, but because we are his. We've been reminding ourselves of these things 
Because as we've been asking this question, like, who am I? We've been reminding ourselves the only answer that can satisfy us, that our identity is in Christ. And so tonight we're going to continue to talk about all of these things. And we're going to continue to answer the question, who, are, who am I? But specifically, we're going to get at this disconnect between our head and our heart and what we think to be true and what we know to be true and how we feel and how we live and how we're experiencing these things in life. And so when I was starting to write this talk, I knew that I really wanted to get practical with you guys. Like I wanted, I mean, I had five steps to how to live out your identity in Christ. And so I started to write this, but the more I sat with it and the more that I reflected on this in my own life, the more convinced I was that the reason that I struggle with this, the reason that I struggle with living out my identity in Christ is not because I don't have a five-step plan. I think you and I struggle to live out our identity in Christ if we're being really honest with ourselves because deep down, we don't believe it. We don't believe what God has said about us is true. Our relationships, our image, our performance, all of these things feel more real to us than what God has said about us. And by believe, we're going to talk a lot about belief tonight, and I just want to make sure that we're on the same page here. So in our 21st century, like, American context, to a lot of us, when we hear the word believe, I think a lot of us uh, think of things that are really internal, things like thinking and feeling and trusting. And while belief is those things, it's also a lot more. To the New Testament writers, uh, they would, whenever they would have used the word belief, they would have, yes, meant belief, like thinking and feeling and trusting. But they also would have meant something like living and experiencing and embodying truth. And so tonight, when we talk about belief, kind of a definition to work off of is believing is living as if the truth about you were true. Living as if the truth were true. So when it comes to our identity, when we're talking about believing who we are in Christ, we're talking about living as if what God has said about you is true. And so Paul gets at this like again and again throughout the New Testament. And so we're going to look at a couple places. He kind of like unpacks this pattern for us. And so let's go to, I think, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So this is Paul speaking. And he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, not in Christ just means to be like a Christian. So if anyone is a Christian in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. And so Paul keeps going in Ephesians 4. He says that you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so I'm going to pause here for a second and leave this up just for a sec. Um, I know that some of you in the room have, have recently become Christians. Like, I've gotten to talk to some of you, and it's, it's really awesome and so encouraging to see. And you're just now starting to wrestle with this tension of, like, who Christ has called you to be and this new identity and this new nature and this new way of living. And you, like, know that, but you're also living with this tension of, like, who you used to be and what, what you've done and who, who you were. And I think Paul gives us this like really beautiful language here that you are no longer defined, you are no longer identified by who you once were. You have been given an entirely new identity, an entirely new nature, and an entirely new way of living. It's so, so cool. So Paul keeps, keeps like hammering this point home. In Colossians 3.10, he says, put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of the creator. So Paul is saying, like, over and over again, to put on our new self. And now, I don't know about you, but I have read this, read these passages before and been kind of frustrated. Like, to me, this does not feel super tangible. Like, okay, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to put off myself. And, and then I'm going to now also put on my, my new self, like, I don't know, that doesn't, like, super compute with me, I don't know about you, 
But I think what Paul is speaking to here is he's speaking directly to this part of us that is like disconnected between our head and our heart, between what we know to be true and how we live. Because uh, where this translation says, can we put it back up, sorry, uh, put on, put on the new self, in other translations, uh, it says to clothe yourself. So put on your new identity or clothe yourself in your new identity. And so just like go here with me, like picture literally what Paul is saying. Imagine that you have a job interview next week. And it's like your dream job interview. You can't believe that you got the interview. You are so nervous. You want it so bad. Like, what would happen to your confidence level if you showed up in your pajamas? Like, I mean, I would, I would, I would be mortified. Like, I, would, I wouldn't even interview. I would just walk out. Or maybe think about, like, if you had a date on Friday night and you're really excited about it and you really like this person and also you're really nervous and so you decide to clothe yourself uh, with clothes that make you feel really confident. And so Paul is saying, like, clothe yourself in your new identity. Put on your new identity. Live as if the truth about you was true. Even when you feel different, even when you're super nervous, put on your new self. Believe and live it as if it were true. And this is, like, way easier said than done. I mean, doing this in real life is really, really hard. And I think it's really hard because we have an enemy that does want, wants to keep us from living out our identity in Christ. We have an enemy that wants to keep you from li- believing and living as if the truth about what God has said about you is true. And one of the ways, he does this in a lot of ways, and he's really good at it. But I think one of the ways that he is really, really good at it for our generation is through fear. And so by fear, I mean an insecure view of yourself or your future. An insecure view of yourself or your future. And so how this plays out is fear is an emotion that is like a natural part of the human experience. Like fear is actually supposed to help us. Like I want fear to jump in whenever I'm walking on the street and a car is coming really fast. I want fear to jump in and so that I can get out of the way and I don't get hit by a car. Like, that's fear in its, like, best light. But sometimes fear comes in, swoops in, whenever the, da- like, the danger that we perceive, whether or not that danger is actually there. And so fear can kick in whenever you're talking to that friend that you know isn't a Christian and they ask you explicitly about what you believe. Fear kicks in because you know that your identity is ultimately in Christ and not in the, in the outcome of this conversation. But at the same time, like, you want this conversation to go well and, and you don't want to influence the way this person thinks about God or you don't want to offend them and you don't want to, like, ruin this relationship. Or fear can kick in about school or work. Like, you know that you're enough, not because of how you do on this exam, but because of how Jesus, what Jesus has done on your behalf. Like, you know this, but also, you know that you need to get a good grade in that class because you're applying to things like nursing school, because you're trying to get into that internship, and you're trying to get that dream job. Or how fear kicks in in your relationships. Like, you know that you already belong because of Jesus, but also you feel like if people really knew the real you, like they wouldn't want anything to do with you. And so you kind of polish off your rough edges and, and you only let people into like a part of who you really are. And for some of you, fear doesn't look like just one, this exam here or that hard conversation there. But I know that for some of you, fear is a lot deeper than that. Like fear for you is, is that deep down, you're never going to be enough, that you're never going to be happy, that you're never going to be content. You're never going to get that relationship. No one is ever going to be friends with you like that. I know that you guys experience, like, really, really deep fear. And I think fear has this power over us for a lot of reasons, but I think a lot of them boil down to this. We believe it. We believe what fear has said about us is true. And we live as if what fear has said, us, said about us is more true than what God has said. 
When, so when you're anxious around a group of people because you think that you're not enough for them, you are living as if what fear has said about you is more true than what God has. And so when you stress about the outcome of that exam, you're, you're living as if what fear has said about you is more real, is more true than what God has said about you. And now I know that a lot of you in this room struggle with like legitimate, sometimes even clinical anxiety. And, and if that's you, what I don't want you to hear from this talk is that you just need to like flip a switch and believe harder and, and you'll be fine. Like, I don't know about you, but anytime that I think that I can just turn off my anxiety, it doesn't really like work out well for me. But I think this is where what Paul is saying throughout the New Testament when he talks about putting on our new identity, I think this is where what he's saying is so good. Colossians 3.10, we read this earlier, but just to kind of help it get in our brain again, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And so Paul is using again and again, actionable, livable words. Put on your new self. Clothe yourself with your new identity. Live as if the truth about you were true. Even when it feels like those thoughts running around your head are more true or are more real, live as if they weren't. Sometimes we got to fake it till we make it. And we don't really want it to be that way. Like, I think we, if we're being honest, like, we want what we feel to flow into what we do. But a lot of studies have actually shown it's the opposite, that, that what we do shapes how we feel and how we think and what we trust and what we believe. And so our habits shape our hearts. What we do shapes how we think and how we feel. Within the last 50 years, psychologists have discovered that the adult brain is less fixed than they once thought. So like for a long time, they thought that our brains like at a certain point just kind of stopped evolving, but they've actually learned that it, they're really malleable and they're really shapeable for our entire lives. And this is really good news. This is what psychologists have discovered, but honestly, this is something that Christians have been saying and believing for centuries. That over time, slowly, our brains can be changed. Slowly, over time, we can be transformed from the inside out. Romans 12.2 says this. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If we live as if what God has said about us is the most important thing about us, and if we live as if the truth about us was really true, we can be transformed slowly over time from the inside out. Our life and our habits can teach our minds and our hearts what God has said about us is true. And slowly, over time, we can start to trust God over fear. And so what if, what if when it came to your relationships, instead of avoiding conflict or instead of putting up walls, what if when it comes to how you think about yourself, instead of letting those thoughts just run rampant, instead of when you approach school and, and work, instead of stressing about your performance? What if you lived as if the truth about you was true? What if you believed already that you are loved enough and accepted in Christ? Like, what would happen to your mind and your heart? What would happen in your classes, in, to your friendships and your relationships? What would happen in your jobs and in your future jobs? As the music team comes back up, um, this is like a weird illustration for me. I'm not a super big into like war news, but for whatever reason, the war in Ukraine um, has really captivated my attention over the last year. And so even if like you're not there and you have no idea what I'm talking about, you'll still be able to track with me. But um, about a year ago, Ukraine was like all eyes were on Ukraine because Russia was kind of lining up against like outside of their main cities and their main ports. And if you're not familiar, Ukraine is a pretty small country and Russia is like one of the most powerful nations in the world. And so, I mean, it was not looking good. Like war analysts were saying that odds that Ukraine was going to win this war were like literally zero. And not only like are they not going to win, but most war analysts said that Ukraine was going to be completely decimated within days. 
And so it's at this time when war is imminent and Russia is outside all these ports and cities that the president of Russia tweets and he says that Zelensky, who is the Ukraine, Ukrainian president, is his enemy number one and his family is his enemy number two. And I think I have a picture of Zelensky and his family. He's the president of Ukraine still. Um, and so he knows that he has a target on his back and he knows that he has a target on his family's back. And it's at this point that the United States offers a safe evacuation for Zelensky and his family. Like, I mean, everyone was pretty much like, dude, you're gonna die. Like, you gotta get out of here. And I mean, I don't know about you, but if he would have taken that, like I would have completely understood. But I think fear can be really convincing like that. So Zelensky so chose to stay. Him and his family are still in Ukraine and he has been fighting alongside his people. And a lot of war analysts have said that it's because of Zelensky's choice to stay that like this is the reason that Ukraine is winning the war and not just winning it right now, but projected to like have victory over Russia like very soon. And all of this is because Zelensky chose to believe and live as if Ukraine had a chance. You and I have been given a better story and a better identity than what fear has told us. Let's know this, let's believe this, and let's live as if the truth about us was true. Amen.